Let's get started. Our first speaker of the morning is uh, Dr. Gregory Flaker. Uh, Dr. Flaker is a professor of cardiology and uh, endowed Sorensen Chair of Cardiovascular Research. He has a tremendous research and academic background and really uh, is a leader in the field of heart disease. And Dr. Flaker will be talking to us today regarding aspirin, high cholesterol, and heart disease prevention. Uh, Dr. Flaker. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here and talk about uh, aspirin, high cholesterol, and heart disease prevention. And I will uh, tell you I have some disclosures. I'm a consultant for uh, a an, uh, company that makes an anticoagulant that I'll mention briefly in this. And I do have grant support, and I'm a consultant for Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, also the makers of a particular anticoagulant. It says up there, Wes and Simone Sorensen, of Chair of Cardiovascular Research. And I want to tell you a little bit about them. Wes Sorensen was, he's passed away now, a uh, professor of anatomy at the uh, university. And when I was an undergraduate here, he was one of my instructors. Uh, he became my patient later on. His wife had a medical condition that we thought was unstable angina at one point, had EKG changes and things like this, and we put her on Plavix as we were getting ready to perform cardiac catheterization studies. She had a CNS bleed and died. So this topic of, is of, of importance to me because he came back later on and said, I think we need to know more about this bleeding and this anticoagulation thing. The anticoagulation is important to prevent cardiovascular events, but we have to recognize that it causes bleeding too. And he says, that's the, one of the reasons why I want to donate money to the School of Medicine. I want to figure out why this happened and, and, and problems like this. So it is with this notion, this balance between anticoagulation and um, bleeding, that we want to talk about uh, certain prevention things in the area of, uh, in the area of uh, cardiovascular disease. Let me start off with a coronary angiogram of a patient who has a myocardial infarction. Let's look at this. This patient, now, uh, for a cardiac catheter, for a heart attack, generally we take the patient to the cath lab. We do mechanical revascularization. This was taken from a number of years ago when uh, we took the patient to the cath lab. And here's a catheter that gets put into the coronary artery, and we visualize to see if there's any obstruction. Here's the left anterior descending vessel and the circumflex vessel. And what do you see here? Chop off. With a heart attack, a blocked up blood vessel. There's something else we saw here, and that is this shadowy stuff, this gray stuff here, and probably right here, that's what we think is a thrombus. A myocardial infarction, there's a thrombus that formed in the blood vessel. And we, at this point in time, our treatment for this, we didn't have the wires, we didn't have the uh, balloons and things like that. What we would do is we would infuse a, uh, an agent, streptokinase, in here, and now we've dissolved this clot with the thrombolytic agent. We've dissolved it and we've restored flow. There's still a high grade stenosis there. This is cholesterol buildup. So, a heart attack, <coughs> acute heart attack, we think is a combination of thrombus and plaque, cholesterol plaque. Two important things here. And acutely, we've gotten rid of the thrombus. Now, sometimes the thrombus is 90% of the obstruction, and the plaque is 10%. Sometimes the plaque is 90%, and the thrombus is vice versa. You know, it's, it's variable degrees of this. But we've recognized that that, that, is, that uh, plaque and clot is a very important part of this. 
when you do an angiogram on this, this very early study, which was uh, heresy, taking a patient like this with a heart attack, we would never think about doing cardiac catheterization studies on those people during a heart attack. Let them cool off. Let them stabilize. Then go and see if they need to be done. This fellow, DeWood, was taking people to the cath lab and finding out that, yes, there were evidence, there's evidence of thrombus material in the vast majority of patients. And hence the notion that treatment for heart attacks could involve either intracoronary infusion of a thrombolytic agent like we did, or later on, the intravenous infusion of a thrombolytic agent, so we didn't have to take the patient to the catheterization laboratory. And that vessel, that vessel that is rupturing, is depicted here, leading this endothelial lining to rent and expose uh, highly thrombogenic products here into the lumen of the blood, blood vessel causes this thrombus. It was interesting that early on in the study of myocardial infarction, aspirin, just the administration of an aspirin during an acute infarction offered the same mortality benefit as the administration of intravenous streptokinase. If patients had no therapy, placebo, here's the outcome event. If they had just an aspirin tablet, a huge benefit compared with placebo. If they had streptokinase, it was good. Now, if you had both of them together, thrombolytic and aspirin, that was even better. So we got into this idea about acute infarction, aspirin is good. Thrombolytic therapy is good. Now, we've come a long way since that time with mechanical revascularization, but this is in our, this is in our, uh, uh, our, our mindset. If you look at patients who have had either a previous myocardial infarction, an acute myocardial infarction, previous stroke, acute stroke, or if they are high-risk patients, looking at all the totality of the information that we have available, there's pretty compelling reason to think that antiplatelets are effective at reducing vascular events. And here, this meta-analysis where they put all of these things together, you get a lot, of, a lot of patients. The line of unity is here. The point estimates all fall to the left of the line of unity, meaning that antiplatelets are better than if you don't give antiplatelets for a patient who's had an acute infarction like we've talked about there, or if they've had an old infarction. So for secondary prevention after a myocardial infarction, aspirin makes sense. That's not a surprise to you. What's the dose of aspirin? Again, if you put all the studies together, it looks like when you look at low-dose aspirin versus higher doses of aspirin, no different. And since lower dose of aspirin would be easier on your stomach, less bleeding, currently we'd say for secondary prevention in this uh, European analysis, there was 75 milligram. In the United States, we have 81 milligram. And 81 milligram, the baby aspirin, is perfectly okay. You don't need 325. 325 is a little bit more hard on the stomach, a little bit more bleeding. Doesn't offer the same, doesn't, offers equivalent uh, anti-thrombotic protection. So low-dose aspirin is okay for secondary prevention. Now let's take it a little bit further. Let's go above aspirin. Let's go to another antiplatelet. Let's go to clopidogrel, Plavix. And in patients who have had uh, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, remember you're thinking of that coronary artery, plaque, uh, uh, rupture, thrombus material, uh, things like that. Let's go with aspirin, but let's go with a little bit more antiplatelet fungus. Let's go with more platelet inhibition, adding clopidogrel to this. And in that set of, set of patients, notice that the addition of clopidogrel to aspirin offers a substantial relative risk reduction, 20% relative risk reduction. <clears throat> and now, now we've got after myocardial infarction, the addition of the baby aspirin, 
and clopidogrel. It seems as though, in the United States at least, many patients with myocardial infarction are taken to the cath lab. They have one of these stents put in. This benefit with clopidogrel is particularly benefit, beneficial in revascularized patients, patients who have stents, metal stent in the coronary artery. We don't want the blood cells to clot on that metal stent and form a particular benefit with this. If you look at this, though, even though there's been a substantial risk reduction, this curve after a heart attack isn't flattening out. It's still going up. There's still events that are occurring after the myocardial infarction. And so there's this push to say, what, uh, we gotta do something more. Let's, let's give more uh, inhibition. Should we give it with aspirin? Maybe we could give a higher dose of aspirin with this. And that doesn't seem to be the case. In, in fact, if you're looking at this, I've divided this up into aspirin, which is lower dose, less than 110, medium dose, and then higher dose, greater than 200. <coughs> Notice that uh, with aspirin or with aspirin plus clopidogrel, there's a, like a little bit of a U-shaped configuration. There's not compelling data to say that if you took a patient after a heart attack, gave them Plavix, and then added a little bit higher dose of aspirin, you would prevent events in a more effective way. On the other hand, if you do that, you're going to get more bleeding. That is a theme that you will hear. We want more anticoagulating effect, but we're going to pay for it with more bleeding. And so 325 of aspirin and 75 of Pla uh, Plavix, we're worried about that. And I think you guys have been worried about that in the match study, too, with the excess bleeding. So now. We've got a little bit more anticoagulant effect, but we've also got more bleeding. Which leads now to the concept, kind of antiquated, but it is kind of neat to go over. It's the red clot or the white clot. And the Japanese came up with this idea of not only doing a catheterization on patients during a myocardial infarction, but they were taking a little microscope and put it into the coronary artery and actually looking at the thrombus. You can imagine that. You'd have to put the scope up there through the catheter. You'd have to flush out with saline to, to prevent the flow of blood from going there. And then you'd look at the clot. And they, they started talking to us about red clot and white clot. White clot would be mainly platelets. Red clot would be anticoag or coagulation factors. And so they were came, coming up with the idea that a lot of times, if you're going to inhibit this white clot, you need more antiplatelet. Uh, activity. If you were going to get rid of the red clot, you needed more um, a formal anticoagulant, which led to, ask, uh, to warfarin. What about warfarin? Uh, a trial that kind of went under the radar screen for a lot of people, the Warris study, published in the New England Journal about 10 years ago, took patients after a heart attack, and they said, let's give aspirin 160 or warfarin kind of on the high side of anticoagulation control, 2.8 or 4.2, or we'll give aspirin low dose plus warfarin and modify the dose of warfarin a little bit down to 2 or 2.5. And, and, and let's look at this for events. And if you look at event-free survival, the patients who did best were patients on warfarin and aspirin. Second best was warfarin. The, the least good was aspirin. Now remember, aspirin is our bread and butter guy here right now. But there are data that said warfarin, red clot, is better than white clot. And inhibiting both red and white clot would be better than inhibiting just one or the other. However, we pay for that with more bleeding. So even though it offers more protection against cardiovascular events, we pay for it with bleeding. And let's face it, we don't want to, that, that risk trade-off has not been thought to be effective for us. We don't want to risk bleeding for most people at this time. So even though there's this <clears throat> notion that warfarin is quite effective with red clot prevention, it's usually not used in comparison with uh, aspirin for bread and butter 
uh, myocardial infarction prevention after myocardial infarction. <clears throat> there are data involving anticoagulant factors besides warfarin, which in inhibits a lot of the anticoagulant. And one of those is rivaroxaban, which is a factor 10A agent. Rivaroxaban is currently available for treatment of stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. It has been tested in a lower dose in patients after acute myocardial infarction in the ATLAS-2 study. And again, inhibition of the red clot reduction in events at the expense of extra bleeding. This is an unlabeled use of this agent, rivaroxaban. It's not commercially available for this use, but it does show the idea of inhibiting the red clot, again, at the expense of bleeding. What about if we combine things? What if we combine warfarin with a little bit of aspirin, and now we like Plavix, too. We like the three of them together. Uh, a lot of bleeding with that. Warfarin monotherapy would be, uh, the point estimate would be here if you consider aspirin monotherapy, a little bit less bleeding, but you can see as you start adding up therapy, particularly the so-called triple therapy with aspirin, warfarin, and Plavix, man, you're going to pay for that with bleeding. We, we are concerned about that. And I'll bet if you look at your stroke people who come out of the stroke, you guys are using pretty heavy duty dose of uh, aspirin and occasionally that patient will also be on warfarin for a variety of reasons. Is it possible that the new oral anticoagulants, the, these novel, these NOACs like rivaroxaban, like apixaban, maybe they won't have as much bleeding when you add aspirin to them as warfarin does with it. Doesn't look like that's the case. All of them, the bigotran, the thrombin inhibitor, rivaroxaban, the 10A inhibitor, in this study, apixaban, the 10A inhibitor, all have excess bleeding with this. And so that's where the standstill is. Inhibition of the red clot, inhibition of the white clot, antiplatelet with antithrombotic therapy, with anticoagulant therapy, that is going to be the Achilles heel for these people in the future. Why is bleeding so important? It's interesting. We, the cardiologists, are very much concerned about this. If you took a patient with acute coronary syndrome and you stopped to think in the coronary intensive care unit, these people get heparin or Lovenox, they get Plavix, they get aspirin, they get a glycoprotein 2B3A agent, they get taken to the cath lab and get additional doses. If you, and then, that, then you've got a stick in the, in the groin or you've got a stick in the radial artery or something like that. If you have a bleed, a major bleed, you can define that as needing a transfusion or needing dropping so much in the hemoglobin, however you define it. The risk of mortality, if you look at those people with a major bleed compared to those people who don't have a major bleed, five times excess. And in atrial fibrillation, if you have a major bleed, excess risk of mortality. So you have a patient who has a bleed, that patient has a five times higher mortality than the person who doesn't have a bleed. And in fact, even in the atrial fib studies, even minor bleeding is associated with this. So here's, that's the balance we've got now. We've got the balance between bleeding versus anticoagulant effect that we've got to be aware of. And it's a challenging because, at least in my part of the uh, world, in atrial fibrillation, there's a lot of people who have atrial fibrillation and you're thinking about an anticoagulant, warfarin, or one of these novel oral anticoagulants, and they've got vascular disease, particularly coronary disease. In this survey, 30% of people with atrial fibrillation have coronary disease. Well, if you've got coronary disease, what do you get? Aspirin. If you get atrial fibrillation, you get warfarin. Now, which, is, which one do you use? You're going to have more bleeding. That's an that's a issue that we've got to talk about, particularly with Simone Sorensen's case. I will tell you that the cardiology point of view looks at this, and in, in the active 
trial, which took people with atrial fibrillation. We looked at people who had clopidogrel plus aspirin versus oral anticoagulant. We, we do know that warfarin was better than aspirin and Plavix in atrial fibrillation. But if we did a subgroup analysis on this, it's an interesting study comes about. It's an interesting analysis. How many people in atrial fibrillation study had a myocardial infarction on clopidogrel plus aspirin? Well, we found 36 in this study. How many people had a heart attack on warfarin? 23. Uh, not statistically significantly different, but at least it gave us the idea that if you have stable coronary artery disease, warfarin, if used for atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention, is pretty reasonable to use in the absence of aspirin. Now, acute coronary syndrome, different. A lot of white clot in there. More antiplatelet agents are needed. But in stable coronary artery disease, it looks like warfarin. If you need it for, uh, for atrial fibrillation, that seems to be OK. I'm going to be very interested to see how you guys feel about this. How good, because we, usually we think about carotid disease, we're thinking about antiplatelet. In coronary disease, cardiologists are starting to be more comfortable with using warfarin. And perhaps some of these new oral anticoagulants in place of uh, aspirin. I will say, too, that uh, in patients with coronary disease and all these anticoagulants, what pain medicine do I use for my patient who has a headache? That's the usual thing. Come in, I got a headache, and I get, they've had an MI. You know, aspirin looks pretty good as far as that. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. There was a CERC article that said there's a little bit of increase in coronary artery disease, coronary cardiovascular events with, uh, with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. These are all of them listed right there. You know, you've heard the COX-2 story. And I have to admit, I'm a little nervous about using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents in patients with with uh, vascular disease, and even acetaminophen, Tylenol, has uh, some small increase in cardiovascular events if you use it in high dose. So this is a challenge for us in how we treat patients for pain who have coronary disease. So in summary, in this part of the analysis, aspirin after MI. Pretty good, pretty strong evidence that aspirin's good for secondary prevention. Low dose is good. If you add additional antiplatelets, or anticoagulant therapy, you're going to have maybe a little bit more protection, more bleeding risk. It's about where we stand with that. And it seems as though there's this evolving idea that uh, warfarin in particular, and perhaps some of the uh, oral, the novel oral anticoagulants are going to be uh, okay for prevention uh, of uh, vascular events. <clears throat> what about for primary prevention? I will tell you up front, when you look at all this information, and I'll just show you the data, not quite as good as primary prevention. I'll bet most of the people here haven't had a myocardial infarction. We're all wondering, well, should I be on aspirin for this? And the analysis is fairly complicated, but when you put everything together, dividing it from this JAMA article, you take women and men for cardiovascular event reduction. In women, aspirin for primary prevention gets a little bit to the left of the line of unity. If you want to prevent cardiovascular events in a woman who's never had a cardiovascular event, looks like you can do it. Men, a little bit reduction in cardiovascular events. So there is this notion about primary prevention, aspirin looks good. Let's break it down into the component parts for myocardial infarction. Women, doesn't seem to help. The line of unity is equal. The point estimate is right on the line of unity. So you can't go to a woman who's never had a heart attack and said, I'm going to give you aspirin to prevent a heart attack. You can do that for men. Here's the line of unity here. So primary prevention, aspirin for men, yes, makes sense. What about stroke? A little bit different here. Here's stroke. Women looks like a little bit to the left of the line of unity. 
Not so true for men. So it gets a little complicated now for women. So why are you giving aspirin to a woman for primary prevention? You know, stroke prevention. For a man, it's MI prevention. In fact, a hemorrhagic stroke for men falls to the right of the line of unity, and you might pay the price for that if you give it aspirin for a man. There's a little bit more hemorrhagic stroke in men, small numbers, but now it gets complicated now. You've got a therapy that looks like there's benefit, but there's also harm, at least in men, for hemorrhagic benefit. So here's what, here's what you end up doing. You end up starting to do the Framingham risk score, which is a popular thing that uh, many cardiologists do. I think I've got mine here. This is my, I, I calculated my score. Step one, age. I'm 62, so I get 10 points for that. My cholesterol is 230-something, 232, and I'm, uh, so I get a point for that. My HDL is under 40. I get two points for that. Almost see that Texas Hold'em thing, that point estimate just keeps going up. <laughs> you know, boom. Blood pressure is okay. Smoking is okay. So I've got 13 points. So my 10-year risk for having a cardiovascular event is 12%. 12%. Now, if you consider high is over 20% for 10 years. Intermediate is like 10 to 12. So I'm kind of an intermediate risk. So now you go to this uh, thing in annals, and you find out where my event rate is. I have to look this up. So if it's 12%, my 10-year risk is here. You can look at this. 12%. And so I'm in the white zone here, so I would, there would be enough myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. cardiovascular events, for me to be in a favorable profile. It would, I would have a problem with bleeding, I'd have GI bleeding, but generally in this graph, blue, you, you, you probably shouldn't use aspirin for cardiovascular events in low risk or uh, particularly older, older men. Uh, but in this zone, looks like it makes sense. It's kind of a little complicated now. It's the same for women, so you have to refer to this chart for, you know, your patient comes in and says, should I have it or should I not take aspirin? The general recommendation from this is, if you're a man, 45 to 79, you should probably go with aspirin, low-dose aspirin, if, you know, the benefit outweighs the, the risk of GI bleeding. So how do you assess that? Well, have they ever had an ulcer? Do they take a lot of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents that would make that? Those are things that are kind of uh, balancing out. Women the same way. The, the cardiovascular reduction would be in stroke. In men, it would be in MI. Men are under 45. Don't encourage it. Women are under 55. Don't encourage it. Uh, if they're over 80, no recommendation. Don't have data for over 80. So it's this blanket statement for primary prevention, I have to admit, a little bit more complicated than just say, oh, you got a, a heart attack, you take aspirin. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And to confuse it, this analysis came out in JAMA just recently about the bottom line in this is that there's a lot more major bleeding on low-dose aspirin than we thought and when those curves, those boxes were, were calculated, they calculated the amount of bleeding that you had with low dose aspirin. They calculated this number, and this analysis says it's higher. So we might be using less aspirin in the future for primary prevention. In, in summary, uh, for, for primary prevention, <clears throat> less robust data than for secondary prevention, and it differs between gender. You've got to factor in the cardiovascular risk factors and you've also got to factor in bleeding risk, what kind of bleeding risk they have, particularly if there's a history of bleeding and, and things like that. So a little bit more complicated for primary prevention. I'd like to move to cholesterol. And cholesterol, now this is a, you know, we, we take in all this complex information, we try to distill it into what you're doing as a busy clinician in, in front of you. So cholesterol, let's see, my my 10-year risk factor is under 20%, so I'm going to be in this area. I would want my LDL to be under 130, so I'm going to start thinking about 
lipid therapy if my LDL is greater than 160. You can take your patient and use the handout with these LDL ideas and try, try to find out what uh, your goal for your patient should be. If you have diabetes, that's considered to be the same as coronary artery disease. That's such a high risk that it's a risk equivalent. And the risk factors that you think about are smoking, hypertension, family history, and, and age. As you get older, over 45 for men and over 40, uh, 55 for women. So that's the general idea. Now, the stretch of this is that's, a, that's the standard thing. The latest information after the guidelines have been put in is that we want the LDL even lower. There is this mantra about lower LDL. Why? Well, if you have a patient here who is at high risk and they have a high cholesterol, this is a Lancet article, so these LDL units are different than what we use, but let's say that a high risk patient here and they have a high cholesterol, obviously very high risk, very high risk. But if you lower the cholesterol, boom, you get a big reduction in risk. So that makes sense. High risk patient, uh, high cholesterol, give them something, it's going to lower, lower the risk. And uh, less, a medium range patient, a little medium risk, still lower the risk. But even here, a low risk patient with a lower cholesterol will get a measurable difference. And so this is notion about LDL cholesterol, get it lower. Here's what's going on now in, in the clinical trials. <clears throat> you know about statins. Statins will lower the LDL. That's our bread and butter drug. They got a new agent. You inject it. It's like a shot, an insulin shot, twice a month. If I have my patient with coronary disease, if I can keep the LDL under 100, I'm going to give myself a gold star for that. If you can get it under 75, mm, then there's some evidence of lesion regression. Lesion regression. We didn't, you know, the cardiologists used to think, well, you got a 50% lesion in the coronary artery. Eventually, that's going to go to 60, 70, 80. It's going to progress and it's going to close off eventually. Statin therapy would stabilize that. We keep it at 50 or 60. But now there's this notion that if you can drive it down to really low levels, you'll have lesion regression. So many times, if your coronary artery patient can get under 75 LDL, that's good. Now, with this new agent, I went to this meeting, this new agent, you inject it, and they're getting LDL values down to 25. 25. I walked out of there, I said, that's too low. That's too low in LDL. And the uh, investigator says, you know what we've done in cholesterol is we have reduced the risk with LDL reduction, but we haven't eliminated it. And really, isn't that what the public wants? Do we want to reduce cancer or prevent it? Stop it. No more cancer. Do we want to prevent stroke or reduce it? We want to knock it. And so the concept now, the early concept that is going to happen with LDL reduction, this trial is going on now. They're going to run people at an LDL of 25, and they're going to run the other people, the other group, at an LDL of 75 to 100. And they're going to follow them up. It's, that trial is going on now. It's going on for about three years. We'll know that in about three years. But that idea of pushing, pushing, pushing harder. Is it safe? We'll find that out. But that's the concept right now with LDL reduction. Now, there are some controversies. Let's just go over this with cholesterol reduction. Let's just a couple things about this. There are about four things that we'll talk about that are kind of controversial. What about statins? That's our bread and butter. I'll show you some information that statins actually increase the risk of diabetes. Hmm. What about hypertriglyceridemia? We'll go over some trials with that. What about the patient, I've got a low HDL. Let's, let's boost my L HDL up a little bit. And then we'll talk about omega-3s. Let's go through these. There was a trial called the Jupiter trial involving Crestor. It took people who had an LDL 
of 108, not bad, not bad, LDL 108, but they had this inflammatory marker, this high sensitivity CRP that was elevated. You know, there's this notion that if you have a hot plaque, it's vulnerable. The vulnerable plaque, it's hot. It's a little warmer. If you put a temperature probe into the coronary artery, you can actually measure heat. And you can measure hot plaque and, and warmer. Hot plaque is vulnerable. That's the one that's going to break open, cause a blood clot. And if you measure this blood test, you can kind of measure, it's kind of a measure of inflammation. And sure shooting, and you took, if you took a pe person here with a pretty good LDL, but they had a high sensitivity CRP that was up, you'll get a reduction with Crestor. That's the Jupiter trial. So we're, we're kind of interested in this hot plaque concept. But when you gave Crestor, 5.9% of those people developed diabetes versus 5.8%. Ah, oh, come on, 5.9, 5.8, it was statistically significant. Is it clinically significant? Well, it does have some concern. And then they did a meta-analysis on the other ones. And you take a person, there does seem to be with all statins, a little bit of concern about developing diabetes. The uh, FDA has come up with a, a communication saying, <clears throat> we know this, we're aware of this, but still, they continue to believe that cardiovascular benefit of statins outweighs the small increased risk of developing diabetes. Stay tuned on that. This is something that your patients might ask you about. A couple other statin issues while we're at it. Is there an increase in hemorrhagic stroke with statins? There may be. It was reported in The Lancet in 2012. Uh, a dinger. You know, for a while, the statins, they thought more cancer with statins. Now there's this concern about hemorrhagic stroke. It looks like it's a small effect. People say continue on. I still have a lot of patients come to me and say, I, I read this article in USA Today. I, I'm not so sure I want to be on my Lipitor. What about liver risk? Uh, routine monitoring of liver function tests is no longer recommended by the FDA. It's a low risk. It can happen. It's not recommended. I've got some muscle aches. I'm taking Lipitor and my heel hurt. That's my patient this week. My heel hurt. Yeah, well, I told him my heel hurts too. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I want, I want your LDL down low. I want to get it down low. So there's, what, what do you do? CoQ10. I think my, I think it's fair to say you guys who know me, my wife and I are kind of here. We're in a tight orbit around the sun, very conventional. My oldest daughter, is a Neptune orbit. <laughs> she is into yoga, Pilates, hot yoga, all this stuff. She does this stuff. I'm telling her, I say, well, I got a little muscle ache. Oh, Dad, you need CoQ10. CoQ10, what is that? Well, you know what statins, you know what uh, your statin, if you take statins, your CoQ10 level measured go, goes down a little bit. And it's uh, important for mitochondrial function. It's, it's one of those things that's it's poorly understood if it makes any difference or not in cardiovascular events. It doesn't look like it does. But people who are on statins who have muscle aches, so I said, okay, okay, I'll buy it. God, help me. Right? Sometimes if you've got muscle aches, CoQ10 is a reason. It's uh, over the counter. It's not uh, terribly expensive. My friend said, oh, you idiot. You know, there's no controlled clinical. Why do you, you know, it's a placebo effect and things like that. But that's one thing to talk to the patient if they're troubled by aches, and that can help occasionally. Vitamin D can help. You also have to be aware of drug interactions. You know, there's some drug interactions, particularly with simvastatin, which can raise the levels and may give problems. Finally, <clears throat> there's this thing about statins and memory impairment, two common conditions in elderly patients, high cholesterol, Alzheimer's. And it's not uncommon for me, as I share patients with you guys, to give patients the drug holiday from their statin if they're having memory impairment or, or they're starting to have problems with their mini mental score. I haven't, the patients I've, I take off for about three months and come back, I haven't noticed a, an improvement that much, and it might be too early, but the FDA does say it's okay to do that in, in, in selected patients. Uh, it's still under uh, analysis. What about Tricor? Tricor is one of those agents. It's a little peripheral to it. You know, LDL is the big boy. Well, this one will lower the triglyceride, it'll raise the HDL, uh, and so it, uh, it may be of some benefit, 
it is similar, Tricor has similar pharmacologic uh, properties to gemfibrozil or lopid. Remember with lopid, there's this risk of rhabdo. If you give lopid and a statin, a uh, chance of rhabdomyolysis, and, and the product insert says risk of combination therapy with lopid and statins may outweigh the benefit. There's not much evidence in gemfibrozil versus placebo in primary prevention or secondary prevention in preventing events. In the Helsinki trial, there was this MI or sudden death reduction with lopid in the primary prevention that got everybody's attention. Basically, we don't use lopid very much anymore. There's this concern about cancer in rats and things like that. We try to restrict this maybe to people who have very high, very high LDLs and very high triglycerides, but still statins are the main bread and butter. But what if you took a statin and added Tricor to it? You know, Tricor, that was the Accord study. And they said, now remember, statins don't eliminate the risk. Maybe what we could do is bring the LDL down, bring the triglyceride level down, raise the HDL. Maybe that would help. Neutral effect. Didn't help. These are the results. If you looked at the pri primary outcome, microvascular uh, death, anything. Fortunately, CK elevation was, was low, but uh, if you were an investment broker, the Tricor stock went down a lot after this. So we're, we're not, Tricor will give you good lab numbers, but it hasn't been translated into uh, reduction in clinical events. Maybe in this subgroup analysis, maybe patients with a very high triglyceride level and a very low HDL. Maybe, but generally Tricor for prevention of events is falling out of favor. What about niacin? Uh, the idea here would, in the AIM High study was that high dose niacin, extended dose niacin, plus statin therapy would reduce cardiovascular disease if you have a low HDL and a high triglyceride level. So here's the same thing. Niaspan has, uh, increases the HDL. Uh, flushing occurs with niacin, but niaspan reduced uh, flushing. It's a billion dollar market. There's a lot of people out there taking niacin and niaspan. <coughs> Uncertain clinical reduction in events. So you add niaspan with a statin in the AIM High study. Those are the numbers you get at baseline. You get some pretty favorable reduction in triglyceride. You get a uh, elevation in the HDL. You get your HDL goes from 35 to 44. That's pretty, pretty substantial. That's certainly more than you'd get with red wine, which Dr. Fleming drinks regularly for his HDL elevation. Uh, okay, nice span didn't work. Didn't, didn't work. So now the stock for niaspan goes down. We're not using that very much anymore. Interestingly, ischemic stroke, I think you guys ought to be aware of that. Not statistically significantly different, but numerically different. A little bit more ischemic stroke. And so the results of the AIM High study was a little increase in stroke. Uh, it looks like right now genetically determined HDL, low HDL. It's still a powerful risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but we can't seem to alter it very much and make a difference in reduction. We can alter it. We can give niacin and raise it quite a bit, but, uh, but we're not reducing events. Now, there are these um, CTEP products which can really raise HDL. So I've got an HDL of 35, and I could have my HDL up to 85. 85, if I wanted, depending on how much of a torcetropid I would take. I could raise my HDL up dramatically. And all these trials on HDL raisers, torcetropid, increased blood pressure, increased mortality, increased cardiovascular events. Dalcetropid, no cardiovascular events. This is ongoing. The message here, right now, where we are now in 2013, LDL reduction, that's our bread and butter. We're going after LDL reduction. Triglyceride reduction with HDL elevation hasn't translated into the benefit of clinical events. We can maybe with real high triglycerides, you got to pay attention uh, to those people. But our bread and butter is still LDL. Finally, the origin study. 
The origin study took people who had prediabetes or early diabetes and a risk factor, had an LDL of 112, and put them on omega-3 fatty acid versus placebo. Then they were also on insulin and standard care. I've got a lot of university professors. They're all on fish oil. They're all on omega. They want to know what dose. They want to know, you know, three months ago I was saying, well, here, here's what the FDA recommends, your DHA, your EPA, you take this amount of dose, and they come up with a new brand and things like that. You do get a reduction in triglycerides with this, but no event reduction. Now, this, is, this has put me into like a snake salesman in one sense. <laughs> I have three months ago, I was saying, yeah, you know, these guys come and I have two kinds of patients with coronary disease. One patient, can't get them to quit smoking, can't get their cholesterol down, their glucose is too high, blood pressure is too high. Can't, can't. Then I've got the other group that are emailing me, hey, I heard this thing about St. John's wort. I want to take this. You know, I want fish oil. I say, good, it looks good. Now I'm finding myself reversing myself, taking people off fish oil. It looks like it, it might reduce the triglyceride a little bit, but show me the event reduction. So fish oil is, has come down, and I've, I've been taking patients off the supplement. Now I do ask them to, I still think fish oil is important, but probably natural fish oil, like in the, uh, in the food we eat, salmon's high in the omega-3s and tuna, so I'm trying to get people to eat at least two uh, fish meals per week. Questions about the origin study, was the dose of omega-3 enough? And uh, would patients with higher triglyceride values benefit? Is food derived fish oil better than supplements? Right now, that's my uh, policy is to for two fish meals per week uh, for patients. <clears throat> so in summary, this uh, lecture series. Lipid, LDL is the big boy. Remember that. And right now, if you're at 75, that's and uh, had a heart attack, that's optimal. You wonder if you could go down to 25. That's what's going on now. Doesn't look like therapies which lower triglyceride or even HDL have there have less proven event. And uh, so far, the major studies with HDL have been disappointing thus far. <clears throat> so for cholesterol. The lipid modification thing with statins, with lowering LDL, is the way to go. There's some concern about the di risk of diabetes with this, but so far we think the risk with LDL reduction outweighs the, uh, the, uh, the benefit of LDL reduction outweighs the risk for uh, cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. I will end my formal comments there, and I don't know, uh, Dr. Sohota, if we should take uh, questions now, or should we go on to Dr. French? Your pleasure. Thank you for your presentation. I think uh, the next talk is kind of related to maybe we can have some questions after Dr. French finishes. Uh, by the way, when Dr. Flaker says his heel hurts, it has nothing to do with statins. It has more to do with basketball. And I think he, he keeps on making those jump passes and hoops, and I think that's what is doing that.